Silent Hill Decoded, Cult Secrets and Symbolism Revealed. So this is a slide presentation. There's over, I think, 180 slides. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. I Forgive me if I miss anything in the chat because I will be looking at my computer screen for this presentation. Okay. There we go. So here's the introduction. So what is it about Silent Hill that has created such a cult following? We all know that this game keeps us coming back. All of the fans of Silent Hill just keep coming back to this game. So why does it compel us to explore the darkest parts of ourselves? Obviously this game is, and this game explores the deepest parts of the human psyche, right? I mean, this is something that's clearly a strong underlying theme in Silent Hill and a lot of us, including myself, after after playing it, playing Silent Hill originally um, some years ago, I was left with this feeling like there's there's so much to this game and I just don't understand it. So this that's what prompted me to uh, to embark on this journey. So this is the creator of the Silent Hill series. This is maybe you guys could help me with the name here, Kichiro Toyama. And this is a quote in Polygon magazine about the game, Silent Hill. And he said he never really liked the bloody shock fest sort of horror. What I'm a fan of is occult stuff and UFO stories. So he was actually talking about Silent Hill and his influences. So he actually didn't set out to make a shock fest type of horror game. And actually, if you... If you read that article, the, the links there, uh, if you read that article, he talks about how he, how surprised he was when people said it was a scary game because he never set out to make a typical horror uh, game. And it's so obvious to me now after doing all of this research just how profound a work uh, Silent Hill is. So... Doc says, in my opinion, what if a power entity town existed that could draw in a person because of their past actions? They are not dead but alive and can end up in a personal hell. This changes everything. Hmm, okay. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the supernatural for sure. So Silent Hill deeply explores the human psyche like no other game has before or since. And the occult teachings contained in this game reveal some secrets, some very, very old secrets about our lives. So what are these secrets? Some of them you may know. Uh, most of them, I probably had no idea. I, I didn't know about in the game itself. And the game actually, Silent Hill prompted me to learn more about the occult. I thought I knew quite a lot until I studied Silent Hill. There are, um, there's a lot of components to this. So we'll touch on the Silent Hill canon, but we're also going to, we're going to look at all the symbols in the game, we're going to look at all the characters, the ceremonies involved, what they mean, all of the artifacts. I mean, every little, we're going to analyze everything in the game and it's going to, yeah, this is, this is so good, you guys. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to, to do this presentation for you. So we're going to need to learn about the occult in order to really properly understand what's going on in Silent Hill and what the creator of this game, because he was obviously, the creator of this game was definitely a, an occult, a student of the occult and the ancient esoteric mystery traditions. So let's talk about what the occult is and what it isn't. So the occult is a neutral body of knowledge and understanding, and it contains powerful insights into the human psyche and the world we inhabit. Much of occult knowledge is deeply spiritual and psychological. It's not religious, yet all religions use it. So an adept occult student will understand themselves deeply and will know others better than they know themselves. 
So what exactly is the occult? What are we talking about here? Is this just like Satan worship? Well, absolutely not. So the word occult, first, of course, to know anything, we need to know what the word means, right? So the word occult is, actually comes from Latin, and it means hidden from sight. You could think of it as a spiritual dimension or the, the inner world, right? We have the inner world and the outer world. You have the world that you can, we can sense with our five senses, and then we have the inner world. So that's kind of what occult means, right? It doesn't mean Satan or the devil or whatever the church is trying to tell you. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. So if you look at this iceberg here, the part of the iceberg above the water, right, represents like the physical realm per se, and everything happening on the surface. So what we can see, Satan. what we, <laughs> yes, Satan. Thank you. So what we can see, what we can hear, what we can smell, touch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the iceberg underneath the water is the hidden world. That's the that's the unconscious world. It's the spiritual dimension. It's everything going on beneath the surface that we can't see, that doesn't, isn't incredibly, isn't immediately obvious to us. So what knowledge does occultism hide? And so just like the iceberg, occultism comprises or hides two bodies of knowledge. Okay, you have the minor, and this is a, this is a great example using the tarot. Um, the, the minor or lesser arcana, which is the microcosm or the inner world. Okay. So that's the, that's below the surface underwater where the iceberg is. So that's the knowledge of self, the human psyche and how it operates. That's a huge component in silent Hill, huge component, probably the much more, uh, pronounced than the greater arcana, which is the, of course, the macrocosm, the outer world, knowledge of natural law, universal, moral law and the physical sciences. So there's the inner world and the outer world. Okay. This is a very fundamental um, occult concept, having this as above, so below. And you'll hear that in occult circles all the time. And it's a very, very old notion, but it, it runs very deep. As above, so below. Here, uh, I want to make a distinction. When, when we're talking about the occult, there's Eastern and Western, okay? And these traditions are very much related, okay? Here on, I guess it would be the right side of the screen. Yes. This is kind of, these are some Western images here. And I want to talk about this painting. I think this was painted by Raphael. This is a Renaissance painting of ancient Greece. Okay, so here you have, you've got um, Socrates here sitting on the stairs. Uh, you've got Aristotle and you've got um, Pythagoras. So these guys, see these guys in the, in the lower right corner? These guys are all into geometry, right? Sacred geometry and all that stuff. Pyth the cult of Pythagoras. These guys believe that the universe was created and can be, ex it was created in a very logical mathematical sense and everything can be explained ultimately by geometry and math and those kind of things. So you've got these different groups of philosophers with their different uh, views on the world, okay? These guys, okay, here, all of these Greeks, all of these Greek philosophers and, and the pre-Socratics, the people that, well, these guys, they derived a lot of occult knowledge from these guys. This is this is um, Thoth. This is where we, where we get the word thought. He's the god of magic and writing and words. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. There's definitely a connection here. So a lot of these guys like um, Plato and his father, they were uh, they studied in Egypt. They went to the mystery schools and they studied. So Egypt was a clearinghouse, or it was like a, not a clearinghouse, but it was like a central hub in the world at the time for occult knowledge. Um, you probably heard the story of the Library of Alexandria, right? This library was, uh, it's now lost. Of course, it, 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 it burned down. Um, but a lot of that knowledge, before, before the library was lost, the, um, 
so the Greeks actually learned quite a bit from the Egyptians. And the Egyptians, so people traveling from, mystics traveling from the Far East, from India, from China, would would share, would bring things to and take things from the the library of, of, of Alexandria. And, and so you'd had all of these mystery traditions kind of putting together a library in, in Egypt. And that library, that knowledge is what started this, um, you know, we hear about this, almost an explosion of philosophy in Greece, right? And all of these guys, Plato, Socrates, um, Pythagoras, there's every, every key philosopher, I can't name them all obviously, but every key philo philosopher in here in ancient Greece, the who's who of all of the philosophers are here, but let it be known that philosophy and this mathematics and science and all this is far older, okay? This is the beginning of the Western tradition here, okay? So there's a Western understanding of magic and there's an Eastern understanding of magic and they're totally different. Right? There's an Eastern understanding of the occult and a Western understanding of the occult. What I'm getting at is, through Silent Hill, there's a lot of references to the occult, to magic, to alchemy, um, all sorts of really cool stuff. And we'll explore that in detail. But I want to make this very clear for you guys. Because magic is understood in our, in our culture through the Western sense. Okay, So this Renaissance painting and this and of the... The philosophers here, and this Renaissance painting in the lower right. This is a this is a woman. Uh, obviously, she's a witch. She's performing some sort of ceremony. Okay. The Western understanding, or the Renaissance, you know, European understanding of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, that era, where you had these grimoires come out, like the Picatrix, and all of these kind of magic books. Well, this the Renaissance period was a reimagining of the ancient traditions from the East, from Egypt, from India, from China, from Tibet, from everywhere, right? The ancient occult traditions. So we're relatively new at this. So all of the magic stuff that you are accustomed to seeing in movies or if, you, if you've read any grimoires and the, the, the thing about, you know, casting spells and, and uh, drawing a circle on the floor with a sigil and you know, and, and, and invoking, um, doing evocation, evocations and bringing, you know, demons to your service and stuff. That's a Western reimagining of the original understanding of magic and the occult, which com comes to us from Egypt, from Persia, from India. Okay, so it's much, much older. So we're, so what I, what I'm doing with this presentation is. We're going to the roots. We're not just going through the Western reinterpretation because that's what Renaissance means. Renaissance means to to know again, right? Connaissance is the French word for to know, and re, of course, is, means again, right? If you put re in front of something, it means again. So it's the re-knowing or the reimagining of the occult. So that's what the Renaissance period was. It was actually a reimagining of the occult as it was given to us it was given to us through Egypt and it was given to the Greeks. So keep that in mind because a lot of people, a lot of students of the occult don't understand that. They think all of this occult stuff was made up in, you know, the dark ages in Europe, middle ages, you know, the, the Renaissance period or the middle ages in, in Europe. Not so. The occult knowledge is far, far older. It's even older than the Egyptians. The Egyptians didn't invent it. The, I doubt that the, the Hindus invented it, right? It's far older. We can't even go back as far. But just keep that in mind, okay? Because that's something that's going to be um, really important to understand. If you really, really, really want to understand Silent Hill and the occult, then we have to see it through totally fresh eyes. So here's the tree. This might be, some people call this the tree of life. That's more of a Kabbalah reference, the uh, Jewish, Jewish mystic, uh, mystery science. But anyway, so the tree of life demonstrates, just like the tarot has the microcosm and the macrocosm, okay? The tree of life is demonstrating for us the most foundational maxim of occult wisdom. And, of course, that's the microcosm or the lesser arcana, 
of the tarot reflecting the macrocosm, the major arcana. Okay, so the two are really one and the same. So we will see this theme repeated in the game over and over. This is something you can observe inside and in the world around you. So reflect on this teaching and I want you to prove it to yourself. It takes a while to get your head around it. Doesn't the Eastern magic, so I got a question here from Chris. Doesn't the Eastern magic be seen as like healing and stuff rather than some beliefs of magic being evil? Well, that's a good question we're talking about. We're going to talk about that right now, actually. So the occult's a double-edged blade, just like everything in the world. So as with most things, occult knowledge is brought into the world for the betterment of mankind. And when I, and when, again, when we say occult, we're talking about mostly about the unseen or the spiritual dimension, right? Because everything in our world is actually comes from something that's unseen, and then it manifests, right? So really everything fundamentally, could you could say it's occult. And again, occult just means unseen, right, or hidden. So that's the way that I'm going to relay that, um, that, that uh, the word occult. That's what it means to me. It's what it means uh, objectively as well, not just to me. So this is, when you're using the occult knowledge for betterment, this is called light occultism or magic. From the word magi in Old Persian, which means learned or priest class. So the magi in ancient Persia were the only people that could write. They wrote on stone tablets back then. And so when you wrote on a stone tablet, it was called casting a spell. <clears throat> so you spell a word, and that's where we get, of course, the word magistrate. Um, comes from magi. Magistrate is, uh, the magistrates were the ones that were, the, in ancient times, they were the rulers. They were typically, you know, priests, or they were the priest class, and they would cast judgments or spells, and they would cast them in stone. If you could spell, you were a magistrate. You were practicing magic, like literally practicing magic in those times because no one could spell. So if you spelled something onto, if you cast a spell, that was the law. And if you went against that, then if you broke the spell, right, you'd be in trouble. So when used with intentions of control and enslavement, the knowledge, occult knowledge is known as dark occultism or sorcery. So let's make that distinction. Magic would be for, for the betterment, okay, as you have uh, Gandalf the Grey here. And the, um, if you're using occultism to control people and not share it, you're, you're keeping it to yourself, that's sorcery, okay? And sorcery comes from the word sortiarius, one who influences fate or fortune. So you're trying to control or influence people's fate, right? In the... You know, these guys were actually, in Lord of the Rings, these guys were actually the same. They were both good, right? And that kind of illustrates the point that I'm getting at is typically when uh, ancient, when, when, when wisdom is shared and these traditions are handed down, they're used for betterment typically. But then invariably someone comes along who wants to use it f for them, to keep it to themselves and control others. Right, both of these guys started off good, right? Um, but of course, we know nobody can be completely one hundred percent good. There's always that gray area too, because we are human beings, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, double-edged blade. So, yes, Chris. Looks like uh, Dana is. She says she's doing better, so she's not passing out in the Target parking lot. God bless. Okay, so. We're going to talk about exoteric versus esoteric. Same thing as lesser arcana and the major arcana. Same thing as inner world and outer world, as above, so below, right? The exoteric, and here's a chart of kind of the world's religions, you could say, buried underneath. So, so buried underneath the surface of every religion, we have the esoteric or the source, right? So here in the middle, this is, these are the occult teachings. These are the insights that are that have been handed down for thousands tens of thousands of years right the human experience is the same around the world we're we're born we come into this world we we 
we think about, you know, we're the only creatures that can think about our, that one day we're going to die. And we wonder, where are we from? Where are we going? Why are we here? We have all these questions that are unanswered. Um, religion on the exoteric level, the, you know, outward public facing level, will will put a good face on things. But if you're halfway paying attention, you really know that nobody has all the answers and nobody really does. Even if there were a creator to, you know, even if Jesus were to come down tomorrow or whoever, right? Still, there would be so many unanswered questions, even if that were true, right? But there's some there's some very deep teachings uh, at play underneath all of these kind of public facing esoteric. So like the Catholic church has pulled a lot of their teachings or a lot of their philosophy and a lot of their religious doctrine from other places. And we'll see that later. Like for example, the Trinity actually, there's a concept of the Trinity around the world. It's expressed in Egypt. It's, it's expressed in Hinduism. And we'll talk about that. So there's this common pool of knowledge and it comes out in different ways, right? Um, And that's something that we're going to explore a little bit later. But that's something actually in Silent Hill. That's how deep this game is, you guys. It's kind of crazy. That's how deep this game goes. So I need to prepare you. So if you think, well, where's Silent Hill? Trust me, this is going to prepare you (laughs) to understand what's going on in this game. So here are the aspects of the occult that we're going to explore in Silent Hill and that are clearly demonstrated. This isn't a matter of me just kind of extrapolating, like making connections that are kind of flimsy, right? Because you can can tell if, you'll be able to tell. If I'm making some connections that you're like, come on, dude, you'll be able to tell. And you can more than happy if you call me out on that and I'll explain if you have any questions. There were a few times where some of my assumptions, I, in my research, I, um, I made some assumptions, and then I found out that I was wrong. So I've totally, you know, I had to scrap that, and I had to dig deeper until I could find real substantial connections that made sense, right? Because this isn't about like just, oh, this is just my wacky theory. Well, this is my understanding of the occult and how it relates to Silent Hill. So Silent Hill has a huge element of psychology. We all know this, right? We've all felt this. Your unconscious knows this. Your conscious mind may not understand all of the things going on in Silent Hill, but that's where your unconscious is signaling to you and telling you, hey, there's a lot more. And we can pick up on that, right? We can pick up on that sense. So we, myself included, I didn't know a lot about this game when I got into it. And after I finished it, I was like, whoa, this game's really deep. I need to come back here and and learn about this game. So... There's a lot of human nature, human behavior explored in Silent Hill. There's, of course, there's the order. So there's some religious um, overtones in the game. Lots of symbolism in this game. Um, There's some alchemy. And and we're going to go really deep into alchemy. And I'll show you in the game where all of this alchemy uh, is. And you'll be like, oh my god, how did I (laughs) totally, I should have known that. Um, if you're into alchemy anyway, or, or any of this stuff. And of course, archetypes and allegory. So we're going to get in, we're going to be exploring some of the classic tales that are told over and over and over again. And they're told for a deep, a deeply human reason, like slaying the dragon, the hero's journey, things like that. So you may know who this guy is. This is Carl Jung. He is the godfather of modern psychology. He's a, tr- his, um, he attributed his insights on human understanding and behavior to his study of the occult. He even wrote the book, Psychology and the Occult. If you take a psychology class in college, you will learn, a, you'll learn quite a bit about Carl Jung. So no subject is, is widely misunderstood, yet as important to human understanding as occult study. I'm gonna take my camera down for a second so you can see this quote. Synchronicity is an ever-present reality for those who have eyes to see. If anyone was an occultist, it definitely was Carl Jung. We're going to talk about symbolism a lot, and we need to think about symbolism in 
so we live in a literal society, right? Our, our so-called modern society is very uh, literal. We use words and we use, you know, words specif specifically will have one meaning, maybe two. Symbols, obviously, will have layers of meaning upon meaning upon meaning, depending on the context. The ancients didn't think literally. They thought symbolically. They thought holistically. They saw, they would look for how things were all connected. And we've kind of, we've lost that. We live in a so-called modern age, but um, there's a cost to living in a literal society, right? It's why there's so many different religions, by the way. It's because everyone is interpreting uh, the Bible in, in their own way, right? But the Bible isn't written literally like a modern you know, inform, it's not written, written like an informational document, right? That's like literal. Take it at face value, word for word. It's steeped in metaphor, symbolism, symbolic thinking, all that stuff. Okay? So symbols really are an introduction to wordless thought. And this is how the ancients thought. So if we're going to understand Silent Hill and we're going to understand the occult and how it relates to it, we have to, under, we have to get our heads around what wordless thought is. Okay? So each symbol has its inherent meaning, but it's a general meaning, and it acquires a specific or limited significance only through association and use. So there'll be lots of symbols throughout the game, and how they're used in Silent Hill is going to tell us everything. Okay? I, mean, I, I paid very close attention to that. So I won't just show you a symbol and say, here's what it means, but we're going to see these symbols in, in action, and we're going to see the significance of them. So it's sometimes said that a symbol has many interpretations, but this is because we're accustomed to looking at everything from our word-bound mentality, the, the literal sense, right? They, symbols can have many meanings, but they also have universal applications. They do have applications overall. For They can, they can say one overarching thing in all contexts as well, and that's something that we're going to have to pay attention to. And we'll see that throughout the game. And by the way, don't take anything I'm saying at face value or don't believe. I don't want you to believe anything I'm saying. I want you to prove this to yourself. That's really important to do that. Because I had to prove it to myself. Okay, so welcome to Silent Hill. Part 1. Let me know if you have any questions about any of those very basic occult concepts that we covered. We're going to get into alchemy. We're going to get into uh, the masculine feminine energies. We're going to get into the um, Kabbalah, Kabbalah a little bit. We're going, to, we're going to get into some crazy stuff. And it's all in Silent Hill, which is pretty amazing. Alchemy, let's turn lead into gold. We will, yeah, we're going to cover that. We're going to talk about the exoteric alchemy and the esoteric alchemy. Two totally different ways to look at it. So I'm just reading the uh, comments here. Okay. So we all know the story of Silent Hill. Uh, Harry Mason's daughter, Cheryl, adopted daughter, is... Um, begging her her adopted father Harry to take take him to a relaxing to to go on a relaxing vacation to the resort town of Silent Hill and eventually Harry Mason agrees due to car troubles Harry and Cheryl arrive in the outskirts of Silent Hill at night following the winding mountainside road while driving on the outskirts of town Harry sees a girl an astral projection of Alessa Gillespie walking across the road Harry swerves his car to avoid hitting the figure in the road and is knocked unconscious by the resulting car crash. Harry wakes up to find that Cheryl has disappeared and starts looking for her. In town, he sees Cheryl running away and immediately hurries to follow her. Chasing her through the streets of Silent Hill, he finds himself running down a dark alley. The sky suddenly turns dark, a siren blares in the distance, and when Harry lights the area with a lighter, he finds that his entire environment has changed into the other world. Moments later, he is attacked by small, childlike monsters. Despite his best efforts, Harry is eventually overwhelmed and killed. 
And if you're wondering, the other world definitely is the unconscious. And we'll go deep into that. And it's incredibly